Well, good day, folks. Uh, thank you again. Another week's gone by since we, we last met in this way, and, and uh, thank you for having me in your places. Last week I had mentioned uh, or asked uh, uh, that you might consider praying for my wife and our family, and I would ask you to continue to do that as we continue to uh, um, walk with, our, with my wife through her medical situation that she's finding herself in now. And I really would covet your prayers. Thank you very much if you do that. And even if you don't, thank you for being here with me uh, together in this format. Uh, we continue in the sermon series, First Peter, um, A Living Hope. So let me begin by asking you some questions. What are you afraid of? What is your greatest fear? What fear may have a grip on your life today? You fill in the blank there. Marshall Segal, in his article for DesiringGod.com, asked the same question, what is your greatest fear? Matter of fact, that's the title of his article. Yes, Segal would agree with you and me, as believers in Jesus, our sins have been forgiven. The believer is no longer facing God's judgment, his wrath. There's a chorus of an old hymn that reminds us of our secure salvation that we have in Christ. And it goes something like this, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Indeed, believers can say they are eternally safe in Jesus. Yet, as we think about life, we all face fears, don't we? Fears that, as Seagal uh, would say in this article, quote, cloud our sense of comfort and confidence in Christ. This is very interesting because in the last little while, I have experienced this myself with my wife's situation. But I digress. Seagal goes on and calls these kinds of fears in this article lesser fears. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that we uh, make any, they don't make, they, we don't actually feel them. That this doesn't make them any less real. I'm really getting a little messed up there, pardon me. And profound. Yes, we do feel fears. And this is where we can ask that same that question again. What is your greatest fear? Maybe you are afraid of disappointing others or, or failing in some task or life or whatever. Um, maybe you are afraid of... of, of <clears throat> For your children, grandparents, you're afraid for your grandkids. Maybe you're afraid of losing a job. You're afraid because your finances are not very good. Or you're afraid that your spouse will leave you. And here's one that is maybe a big one. Are you afraid of death? So I think we can agree with Seagal that we have in this world plenty of real reasons to fear. Now, another author by the name of George Sinclair, writing for the Gospel Coalition, said this. And it's interesting because this article is pointing out the Canadian culture, and I thought that I'd like to share some of that with you. Uh, Sinclair said this, The average Canadian refers to things as being positive or negative. You see, Sinclair sees uh, this kind of thinking as a prominent feature of the Canadian cultural landscape. So, we can then presume that one thing that Canadians can all agree on is that fear is something negative. Therefore, it's important to distance oneself from fear toward something more positive. And this is Sinclair's bone to pick when it comes to Christians in the Canadian culture. He would say, quote, It is important to realize that positive or ne and negative are not biblical categories. And he would, go on, he would go on to say, quote, you and I need to resist using the categories positive and negative as much as possible. So we have to ask, why? Why, Mr. Sinclair, why should Christians resist using your categories or these categories? We'll let Sinclair answer our question. Quote, shaped by our culture, modern Christians too easily fall into either ignoring the biblical teaching to grow in the fear of God, or when the topic comes up, dismiss the fear of God as something to do away with by the gospel, end quote. If this is true, if Sinclair's thesis is true, then we can conclude that Christians don't want to grow 
in the fear of God. Well, please turn your Bibles to chapter 1 of Peter. As we are content, we're still in chapter 1. We're almost at the end. It's been a while, I know, but we'll get there. And we'll be reading uh, starting at verse 13 through to 21. Verse 13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed uh, to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Verse 17, And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your fathers, forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. I also want to just thank you again, as I have throughout the day for this day, as you have sustained our family and myself and even my wife, even though she seems to be weak at this time. We just trust you for her health, and we trust you not only for that, but we also trust you for your word here, that it will change and mold us and shape us to become more and more like Jesus. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, um, our focus will be primarily verses 17 to 21. However, we remember, uh, we should remember, that when we study the Bible, that context is king. Context is boss, my friends. So with this in mind, we would be wise to consider what the Apostle Peter said leading up to verse 17. We see that Apostle Peter's audience here, just in a few verses before us, were encouraged to be disciplined in their thinking, as they had been grieved over various trials. That's from verse 6, the various trials. Uh, from suffering, uh, because suffering can cloud the mind and lead to all sorts of imaginations and exaggerations. They were to be, uh, as Peter exhorted them, to be sober-minded in their struggles and set their uh, hope fully on the grace that will be brought to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ, verse 13. That is when Jesus returns. The Apostle Peter also reminded them of their past, how at one time they had been conformed or shaped, if you will, uh, by the passions of their former ignorance. Verse 14. But God of mercy, Peter would go on to say, had caused them to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We're back at verse 3 there. And then we remember from last week, Peter exhorted them to holiness when he said, he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. That's verse 15. Well, this brings the context to us here up to verse 17. Why don't we read verse 17 together? Verse 17, And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, deeds conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. So I want to ask a question here. What do, you, who, what do you think the apostle here meant when he said, if you call on him as Father, here in the first half of verse 17? Well, why don't we go to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, as, re, Sermon on the Mount as recorded by Matthew in his Gospel, where Jesus uh, would there teach his disciples about prayer. And we see Jesus would repeat a particular phrase in the sixth chapter twice. And that phrase was, and when you pray. Find that in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 and verse 7. Friends, this is not if you pray. Jesus meant when you pray. There's ex expectation from Jesus that his disciples, and that includes you and me today, will pray. And then he went on to say then to them, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I hope you know the rest of that. If you don't, you can find it in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 9 to 13, the Lord's Prayer. When you pray, pray the Lord's Prayer. Back to verse 17. 
Apostle Peter, in his way, said the same thing as Jesus did back in Matthew chapter 6. So we can reasonably paraphrase the first half of verse 17 like this. And here's the paraphrase. When you pray to the Father, when you pray to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. Now, I think we kind of sorted that out. We know what, what that means. Uh, we, we want to continue here and understand that when we pray as Christians to God, who said, you shall be holy as I am holy, back in verse 16 there, Peter quoting Leviticus 11, 4, 44, we must never forget that we pray to God who judges impartially. He judges impartially. Um, we can go do the Pentateuch, and there we can go to Deuteronomy, which is often referred to as uh, Moses' last will and testament. And there he exhorted the nation of Israel as they were preparing to cross the Jordan into the promised land without Moses. He said this about God. Moses said, For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who so shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. We can go to the Apostle Paul. We find his instructions to the Christians, uh, particularly masters and slaves who were Christians in Ephesus. And he said this to the slaves. He said, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Ephesians chapter 6, 5. And to the masters of those slaves, Paul would say, Masters, do not say to them, do the same, pardon me, Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. Friends, this is something we need to remember as followers of Christ, that God will judge our conduct as believers in the same way he's talking about here to his audience. Peter's the same way as Peter's talking to his audience in the first century, the same way that Moses was talking to the nations of Israel regarding the partiality the, uh, of Christ, of God, the, who judges impartially, I mean, in the same way that Apostle Paul was giving instructions to the Christians in Ephesus. God will judge our conduct as believers in the same manner. I just want to press pause for a moment, and I think there's an elephant in a room that we have to deal with. And I'll, I'll uh, begin that conversation, that brief conversation, by asking you a question. Has anyone ever called you judgmental? You know, you think about our current cultural context in the West, uh, being labeled as judgmental has the possibility of one being quote-unquote canceled. This whole thing about judging others and being judged in the culture and the church has caused, I think, its fair share of confusion in these days. And of course, time and space are not our friends today as we're trying to get through this message in a reasonable amount of time, so we cannot pursue this for as far as we should. So suffice it to say that this, suffice it to say this, that the love of God and His truth are not separated from His justice. Of course, no one likes to be judged wrongly, and frankly, Christians sometimes do so, judge others wrongly. Yet our text today tells us that God will judge our conduct, and one day, He will judge the whole world. So I think it would behoove us that we would take some time to prayerfully study the Word of God on this subject of God's judgment and how we are to judge each other and others. If you and I believe in God, and I hope we do, and I hope you do, I mean, if we love God with all our heart, our mind and strength, and our neighbors like ourselves, then we need to speak the truth. We need to speak the truth, even the hard truth. And when we do that, we do it, I hope, with great compassion and gentleness, love, and respect. Moving along, the Apostle Peter here continued in verse 17, the second half of that verse, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Apostle Peter exhorted the believers that during their exile, that is their sojourning through life, 
that is, everyday life, that they were to conduct their lives in the midst of their trials with fear. With fear, it says right here. We go back to Sinclair's thesis that Christians either ignore the scriptural teaching, quote, to grow in the fear of God, or <coughs> Christians, quote, dismiss the fear of God because somehow the gospel of Jesus Christ does as well. This is not what the apostle here insisted in the text or in his letter to the audience that he was writing to in the first century. And possibly Peter was casting his mind and thoughts back to the words of Jesus. We go to Matthew chapter 16, and there Jesus reminded his disciples that he would suffer many things at the hands, <clears throat> the hands of, uh, of the, the chief priests and elders, pardon me, I had a little brain melt there, in Jerusalem. And Jesus would go on to say to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And then Jesus continued on to say, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return uh, for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he's done. This is found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 through 27. And here's the point, my friends. As one commentator put it, God's, quote, love is a holy love. His justice is a holy justice. In this way, the apostle Peter then could say, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Exile, for God will judge impartially according to one's deed. As you ponder that, let's uh, talk about this word that's translated here in the ESV as fear. Again, time is not our friend, but something really does need to be said about fear. Pardon me. So applying what I like to call the KISS principle, or it's not my own uh, idea, keep it simple, sweetie. The Bible mentions two specific types of fear. One is a beneficial fear, if you will. The second one is a disadvantage, and it is to be overcome. We can put it this way. First, the Bible speaks of the fear of the Lord. This is a beneficial or valuable fear to have, to possess, to pursue. This has to do less with being afraid of something or someone, the fear of the Lord is a reverence, a awe of God, a reverence and acknowledge, acknowledgement of God's mighty power and his awesome glory. And importantly, really important, the fear of the Lord is kept in balance with a proper respect of God's attributes of holiness, his wrath, and his anger. The fear of the Lord, which is beneficial, acknowledges all that God is as a believer grows, as you and I grow in our understanding of God and his attributes. And a proper balance and biblical informed fear of the Lord will be a blessing to a believer, will be a benefit to a believer. For example, the psalmist said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and all those who practice it have a good understanding. Psalm 111 verse 10. You want some wisdom? You want some good understanding? Have the fear of the Lord. Solomon said, concerning the fear of the Lord, that it leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. Proverbs 19, 23. Solomon also said this, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, the one may turn away from the snares of death. Proverbs 14, verse 26 and 27. This is the kind of fear the word of God encourages the people of God, that includes you and me, as I did here in the first century, encourages you and I to grow in the fear of God. Well, there's a second type of fear. The second kind of fear that we find in the Bible is the opposite of beneficial. 
The Apostle Paul describes this kind of fear in his second letter to Timothy, where he said to Timothy, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 2 Timothy verse, chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. Second kind of fear that Paul is describes for us as a spirit of fear, fearfulness. Now, this is not a demonic spirit or some spiritual thing. It is something that happens within us. The question arises then, what do we do? Not if, but when we become fearful. My friend, no one escapes this reality. We all face fears from time to time. And when we think about the Word of God, it is like a mirror into our very souls, and it reveals and uncovers this fact that we are not perfect. And it's because of this that God knows that at times in our lives, dear ones, we will be overcome by fear. And our gracious and merciful, merciful God encourages his children in those fearful moments. For example, he said through the prophet Isaiah, Do not fear, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. What is your greatest fear? Are you afraid maybe of the future? What is your greatest fear? Listen to the words of Jesus, who said to his disciples, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Are not one of them, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 and 31. My friends, if you are afraid, or are you afraid, all of God's promises for his people are there for the asking. When fear comes your way, and it will, we can rest in God's promises. We can rest in God's promises and put our complete trust in God to keep them. And my friends, sometimes you have to do that from moment to moment to moment, like I have done over the past few weeks with my situation. When fear threatens to overtake you, trust God and refuse to give into that fear. Turn to God in those dark times of your life and trust Him that He will make things right. Maybe not the way you understand it, but God is a good God all the time. Well, back to our text. Let's read verse 18 and 19 together. Uh, verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Here in two verses, the Apostle Peter uh, once again reminded his audience, his readers, those elect exiles he was writing to, of the great salvation they had received. Their fear of God is not misplaced as Peter reminded them that God in his mercy had ransomed them from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. The first half of verse 18. The Greek verb translated here in the ESV is, you were ransomed. And the sense here is to be or become redeemed by the payment demanded for one's return. In other words, set free. Now, I hope you remember this. We already heard this from Peter in the beginning of his letter in another way. Peter said in verse 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. What an amazing living hope that believers have received. And the payment is what? What is the payment for a believer's redemption? Well, Peter goes on and explains in verse 18 and 19, it was not with perishable things like silver or gold or works or anything, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish. 
you remember what John the Baptist said uh, when he first saw Jesus coming to him? He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. It's not the first time he saw Jesus, but as the Messiah. The Apostle Paul said of this great salvation that Peter is describing for us here, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. That's in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3, verse 23 to 25. Truly, my friends, Peter, Peter's audience had received a costly and great salvation. And you and I would do well to remember that what God had promised his elect exiles in the early church, he has promised to you and me today a costly and great salvation. And we can say then, along with our brothers, ancient brothers and sisters, by faith that believers have the friendship of God as they live their lives in each and every circumstances, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know why? Because of the precious blood of Christ. You know, as we think about our times today in the 21st century, in the West, we live in interesting and challenging times as followers of Christ, as Christians. We see the Western world is now fully immersed, neck deep in secular ideology, and at the same time, which is kind of like a paradox, encourages and accepts a diverse mixture of spirituality and religion. Often this diverse and cultural phenomenon has, has impacted the Western church. What was once orthodox, things like the virgin birth of Jesus and the deity of Jesus, to mention a few, are being tossed out or replaced with a number of options. The mantra is inclusion and diversity. That's the mantra of the day. Then we have the Apostle Peter. Then we have the Bible, I mean. But then we have Apostle Peter today, who said of Jesus in verse 20 and 21. Let's read that together. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. It doesn't sound very diverse there, does it? Sounds quite exclusive, matter of fact. Friends, Jesus Christ is none other, according to the word of God, according to his own witness, according to his life and uh, death and his resurrection and ascension into heaven, none other than God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. And this Jesus of the Bible that Peter points to was set, sent at the right time to the right place in real history to a real people, who, as Peter put it here so well in verse 20, was made manifest In other words, another way of putting it was revealed in the last time for the sake of you and me. The writer of Hebrews is helpful for us also, who said this, Long ago at many times in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in his last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and 2. Luke, Dr. Luke, records the day of Pentecost and the preceding events in Jerusalem in his work that we call Acts or the, or the Acts of the Apostles. We go to chapter 4, we find the Apostle Peter and John before the ruling council in Jerusalem where the Apostle Peter said of Jesus to this ruling council, there is salvation and no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 verse 5. We go back to Jesus in John's gospel. Hours before his arrest and his crucifixion and his death, he said this to his disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. This is where Peter's audience had placed their faith and hope in Christ. May we do likewise. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you. Thank you for this great and wonderful salvation that you have given to us. Your mercy is amazing. Your grace is amazing. 
And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks, folks. God bless you. I pray God blesses you and keeps you and makes his face shine upon you. Shalom.